welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Let's get into the word. I know you didn't come to hear from a man. I know you didn't come to hear from a woman. Why? Because men have nothing to say. We don't come to hear from the old. We don't come to hear from the young, the white, the brown, the black, whatever, any other, any other thing like that. We come to church to hear from God. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you just join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? And let's, let's go before God today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in church. Lord, we thank you that we have the freedom and the privilege to come and congregate together with people of like-minded faith and and, 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 and like-minded belief in Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't come to church to hear from a man. We don't come to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church for entertainment or tradition's sake. But Lord, we do come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister minister to us, to show us things, to to bring the Word of God alive to us, to plant the seed of the Word of God into our hearts and into our lives, that we would leave this place cultivated, water that Word, that it would bear much fruit in our lives, God, that people would see the glory of God and the goodness of God in our lives. So, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. We don't ask these blessings just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers and members of the same body, the body of Jesus Christ, working together for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventists and Presbyterian and Methodist and Episcopalian, Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Pentecostal, Charismatic, and Foursquare brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our local churches in the Inland Empire that are all serving the kingdom of God. Lord, we ask that you would bless them today. Harvest, sandals, the grove. Lord, we thank you for the well, for uh, the way. Lord, we thank you for Emmanuel Baptist, for Ecclesia. Lord, for Trinity. Lord, we thank you for Crossroads, Abundant Living, uh, all the churches all over the Inland Empire. Lord, and around the world, we thank you that we are all many members, the brothers and sisters of Christ, in, in Christ together, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated... Grab your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Hebrews as we resume our study of Hebrews in the sixth chapter. I tell you, I'm excited for what God's got in store for us. Last week, we took a break with uh, Hebrews as Reverend Mike Keyes from the Philippines came. Now, what an amazing opportunity that was. Did you guys enjoy Mike Keyes last week? I tell you, one thing I enjoy so much about Mike Keyes is he's a man who not only preaches the Word of God, but he lives it. And it's evident in his life, and that's awesome for us as a church to gather together and to see what the support as a congregation goes to in seeing tens of thousands of people around the world come to know Jesus Christ because we together in San Bernardino are supporting missions around the world. How awesome is that? Well, today we find ourselves in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. I want to encourage you, if you didn't hear last or two weeks ago, two weeks ago message from Pastor Dan about the covenant and before that, the security of the word of God, I want to encourage you, take some time this week, go online, use your phone or your computer, or if you don't have a phone or computer or anything like that, you can stop by and grab the CD. I want to encourage you just for, some, for a moment though to go, go online this week or get that message, take a refresher course because what we're talking about today is really built upon the things that we have been discussing in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. See, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. So the verses leading up to where we're at today is really what have built the foundation on what we're talking about today. The title of this morning's message is this, Hope, the anchor that holds us. Hope, the anchor that holds us. Now in August, I remember I got to teach a message on hope, the full assurance of our hope. So we're not going to necessarily discuss the subject of hope, but today the Bible paints a picture for us about this hope that you and I have a, have a, a grasp of uh, that is the anchor that holds us in life. Now let me paint a visual picture or a metaphorical picture for each and every one of us as we get into Hebrews in the sixth chapter about what's going on. So imagine this, you and I are like... We are, uh, in reference to, we are like a ship at sea. We are at the mercies of the water and the wind, and we are always in danger of being cast out. You see, our souls are the vessels uh, of, of, the, of this journey. Our comforts, our expectations, our graces, our happinesses that we uh, expect in life, this is the precious cargo of the ship. Our destination and the port to which we sail towards is heaven. Temptations, persecutions, afflictions, trials are the wind and the wave and the obstacles that would threaten our shipwreck. 
So here's a picture of you and I as a boat in the ocean, and as this boat in the ocean, our lives, the things in which we carry throughout our life are the cargo in which we do. We are headed in the direction of heaven, but in that direction, storms will arise, the persecutions, the afflictions, the trials, the hard times that we go through threaten our very shipwreck and threaten us to be crashed out on the rocks. But the Bible gives us some hope. The Bible gives us some things that we can stand on in the Word of God. In Hebrews, in the sixth chapter, verse number eighteen, talking, of, uh, picking up in the middle of a in the middle of a thought, which we talked about two weeks ago. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number eighteen, says that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Verse number 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So today we're going to look at the subject of the 19th verse, but before we get into the 19th verse, let's just take a quick review of the 18th verse. That these two immutable things, these two immutable or unchangeable or undeniable things are that God in his, in his covenant with Abraham gave Abraham two things. Number one, he gave Abraham his word. The second thing that God gave to Abraham is God gave Abraham an oath or he confirmed it with an oath. You see, it is not God, uh, God cannot lie. It says that God cannot lie. It is immutable. These are what we stand on in the word of God. You see, God didn't have to promised Abraham anything. The word of God is enough for you and I, but yet God went through the extra mile so that you and I could have a strong consolation. God went over and above the expectations of mankind by giving to man an oath based on God's very existence, his word and his promises. So now you and I have a strong consolation, which means we're not just, oh yeah, that's great, that's wonderful, I'm sure God's promises are good and, and all that. No, no. We have a solid foundation on which we can stand because God gave us his word and God gave us an oath through Abraham. And because God's word is true, because God's word is truth, we have a foundation on which we can stand goes on to say that we have fled for refuge. You see, this paints a picture of a boat in a storm, that we can seek shelter. You see, we have got to understand, church, that because God is there for us, that we have the ability to go to God and seek refuge for the things in our life, that we can seek refuge under the shadow and the shelter of God Almighty. We don't just rest in the refuge of the peace of the circumstances around us, but rather we base it on God and on God alone. The last thing that we talked about, in, uh, or we see in verse number 18 before we get into this anchor that we're talking about today, is that we who fled for refuge lay hold of the hope that's set before us. You see, laying a hold of the hope that's set before us means that we grasp onto the hope. Now, a couple months ago in August, we talked about this, the full assurance of hope, as Hebrews in the sixth chapter taught us. We realize that we don't base our hope on circumstances. We don't base our hope on the things that are going on around us. Uh, the world would hope in a way like this. I hope that it rains tomorrow. I hope that I win the lottery. Great, wonderful, but when that doesn't happen, we have nothing to base our hope on. But see, as Christians, we have a different hope, a hope that was given to us by God through the Holy Spirit, through the love of God that was shed abroad in our hearts. Our hope is not based on circumstances, but rather it is based on God, the solid rock. So now we have this hope that we lay a hold of, but here's the thing, is that we don't lay a hold of this hope, but rather this hope lays a hold of us, because now it takes this hope in verse number 18, and look what it equates our hope in God, the promises and the word and the faithfulness of God, it equates our hope to this. Verse number 19 says, this hope, this confident expectation we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure, steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. You see, an anchor is a very tool that the boat uses or a ship or a vessel uses to keep it from slipping, to keep it in its position while it's at sea. It's grounded on the, on the sea floor, on the rock or in the sand, and it holds that ship secure. You and I have an anchor. That is the anchor of the Word of God, the two immutable things, God's Word and God's promises that are for you and I, like we talked about, that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. We have this now as an anchor which keeps us in life through all the different things that we go through. 
But I love this anchor that we're talking about today. I love how the author of Hebrews gives us some description. First off, it says this anchor is sure. I love that. You know what that means? That this anchor is trustworthy. This anchor is going to hold. It's much like this. Think of something that is sure or how about this? Unsure. I'm sure that every one of you have seen or even owned or hey, some of you have may have even gotten to church in a car. You drove up to that car. You walk up to that car. Somebody says, hey, come on, let me drive. And you see the car. The car has 15 different paint jobs, four different types of tires on it. There's no more tread left. The hood's shaking. The mirror held on by duct tape. There's nothing left. Windows are covered up with tape or whatever it might be. You look at that car and you scratch your head. You say, man, is this thing safe? Is it going to get me to where I need to go? I've, I've talked to some, especially young people who say, Pastor Luke, man, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my car every day. Praise God. But you see, the anchor that you and I have is not like that hoopty we used to drive. It is sure. We can rest assured that this anchor is reliable. Why? Because it's not based on flattery. It's not based on imagery or, or, or something that's not of substance, but rather it is based upon the very word and the promises of God, which means that you and I can rest assured that this is safe and it will hold. I love the second description. The anchor for our hope is steadfast. You know what that means? That means that this anchor is not going to break apart. It's not going to let go. It's not going to not serve its purpose. You think of those great oil or cargo tankers that, that cross the oceans and they carry the goods from one country to the next or from one area to the next. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of tons of weight in the ocean. You see, they don't have a little dinky piece of metal anchor. They have an anchor that is designed and sized for the size and weight of that boat, which means it is steadfast. They, when they drop that anchor into the water as they're waiting to come into port, they know that that anchor is not going to break apart. They know that that anchor is the right anchor for that boat, that it will hold whatever the storms may come. You and I have a steadfast anchor. It is sized for the weight of our lives, for the weight of our vessel, for the cargo that we carry, our expectations, our hopes, which means that our anchor, guys, in the Word of God is big enough for us to hold on to. But I love this third one. This third one is where it gets a little bit deep. It says, which enters the presence behind the veil. Now, I think of it like this. When you drop an anchor, you're generally standing on the deck of a boat. The deck of the boat is on top of the surface of the water. If you're on a boat and you're not on the surface of the water, you've got problems. But as you drop the anchor, which direction does the anchor go? It goes down. I have never, and I don't think mankind in general, has ever seen an anchor that when it is dropped, goes up. Because it goes down into the water. Now, the, the, the very nature of light is that you can't see deep into the water as you're looking from the surface because water refracts light, which means once light hits water, it spreads. So you might be able to see six or seven or eight or ten feet deep, but when you're 100 or 200 feet above the ocean floor, that anchor goes and it is, it is hidden behind the veil of the water. The only way for you to tell if that anchor is lodged is to pull back on it or to put the weight of the ship and to see it is holding on to something. Now see, us, we have an anchor that is not driven into the ocean or driven into the water, but rather it is in the presence, the P, capital P there, meaning the very presence of God. You see, in the Old Testament, God occupied uh, uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple or in the tabernacle. This was a small room in which only one person was allowed to enter, the high priest, one time a year to make sacrifice or atonement for the sins of the people. Other than that, if you went before the presence of God, you would not live through it because God was too powerful for that. So it was covered by a great veil, a great uh, thick and mighty curtain that would take uh, several men to move it to one side or to the other so that somebody could enter into the presence of God. You see, our our anchor is not just rooted in the promises and the word of God. That would have been sufficient enough for us. But rather now it says that our anchor is in the very presence of God. Which means that you and I, our anchor is lashed or is wrapped around or is attached to to the very throne of God. It's as if God in heaven has his foot on top of the anchor that holds our life. And you know the Bible says that the earth is the footstool of God. So that means that nothing that comes our way will dislodge that anchor from its sure foundation. Wow! 
What an assurance we have. What a blessed assurance that we have that we know that God is doing everything he can just in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, to assure you and I, the Christians, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can hold on and be steadfast in the walk with God. God has given us many a thing to, to stand to. Now this anchor of our hope gives us some encouragement. And today I want to give you three things. I'm going to make a statement. Our anchor and hope means we are. I'm going to say this statement and I'm going to finish it three times today as an encouragement to this anchor and what this anchor of our hope means for you and I and how we can live and operate our life. Now I promise, I guarantee, if you grab a hold of these things and you apply them, you live them, you think about them, you ponder upon them, you meditate upon them like the psalmist said, this will change and solidify your life for the things of God and you will not be shaken or you will not be moved in the trials of life. So our anchor and hope, number one for this morning, means we are not gripped by fear, but sound in mind. We are not gripped by fear, but sound in mind. You see, it is not the call or the will of God for us as Christians to live a life of cowardice. To be afraid of what tomorrow holds on to. To be afraid of what tomorrow might bring. I know that oftentimes as humans, the thing that we always want to know is what if, what if, what if. You know, but the reality is, is that there are so many what ifs in our lives that we can't focus on those. But we have an anchor in the word and the promises of God that are true and faithful through generations and millennium that we know that we don't have to be afraid of what tomorrow holds. We don't have to be afraid of what the world has for us. Like Jesus told his disciples, you will face persecution. But he gives them the anchor. The anchor is, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. We don't have to be worrisome. We don't have to be afraid or cowardice. Yes, the Bible tells us that you and I ought to and have to have a fear of God or a reverence, but we're speaking to the subject of cowardice. I love in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, verse number 7, and one of the verses that as a child I memorized, probably the first thing I ever memorized, you ought to memorize this yourself as Christians and put it to memory and apply it and quote it and speak it and believe it. As exhortation to Paul, or from Paul to Timothy in the, in the sixth, chap, or sixth verse, he says, Therefore, Timothy, I remind you, to stir up the gift of God. Hey, listen, life is going to come its way. It's going to try to knock you down. It's going to try to, to pull your thoughts away. Fear is going to rise up, but you've got to stir up the gift of God that is inside of you. You see, it is not God's calling, nor is it God's gift for you to be a, live a life in fear. So he says, stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse number seven, I love it. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. You see, God has called each and every one of us. He didn't tell his disciples to go out and to make disciples of all the nations, but do it timidly. He said, no, go out. You have power. You have love. You have a sound mind in which you could go out and be like what the Bible describes of us, the brothers and sisters of Christ, to be more than conquerors. We don't have to live a life of fear. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are spiritual. The things that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God are what we battle. Fear is and cowardice is one of those things that comes in and says, God's word's not going to stand in you. God's word's not strong enough. It, you, it doesn't apply to you. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't say this. You can't make it. See, it brings itself up above the knowledge of God. But the Bible continues to tell us that we put those thoughts into uh, subjection. We discipline them by obedience, by following God, by realizing that, hey, we don't have to live a life of fear because God has given us power, love, and a sound mind or solid thinking in our lives. Oh, it's good stuff, church. We don't have to be afraid. Why? Because God has us covered. In Genesis, the 26th chapter, I'm just going to put it up on the overhead. I have got it in the New Living Translation up here for you. Genesis in the 26th chapter, Isaac, Abraham's son. Now, we talked about Abraham in the 6th chapter, about the covenant and the promise of God. God made a promise to Abraham. Now, Isaac, his son, is alive. Abraham is gone and, and, and has passed away. Isaac gets at a time of famine. He goes and he, and he dwells in the, the land of the Philistines with King Abimelech. And after there, after some time, Isaac becomes prosperous again. Abimelech comes and says, listen, you've got to get out. We can't sustain you anymore. You've got to leave this place. 
So Isaac goes back to the land of his fathers, to the place where his father dwelt. You see, back in the day, they didn't have gas stations. They didn't have AM, PMs. So they couldn't just stop and get a 64 ounce uh, of water or, or of soda to, to, to quench the thirst in the desert. They had to go from water to water. Abraham had, Abraham had dug wells in the land in which he occupied. And so they were going from well to well and they would find these wells would have, would have been fi filled in by the, those who had opposed Abraham. So they would dig a well and somebody would come and oppose them and they'd move and they'd dig a well and somebody would come oppose them and they'd move and dig another well and there was opposition after opposition. And so finally it says in verse number 23, From there Isaac moved to Beersheba, verse number 24, where the Lord God appeared to him in the night of his arrival and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. God appears to Isaac and he says, Listen, something's about to come your way. I'm going to tell you something, but let me tell you, you're not just talking to anybody. This is God speaking to you, the God of your father, who made a promise to your dad. All right, it's what he's telling him. He said, don't be afraid. Why? For I am with you, and I will bless you. Verse number 24, uh, 24b goes on to say, I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. Why does God do this for Isaac? Because Isaac was great, because Isaac was wonderful, because he has all, was perfect, because he made all the right decisions. Look what God says. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. You see, the promise... The oath that God made that we had just studied in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, to, uh, 12 generations there to David, 14 generations to the captivity, 14 generations again to, to Jesus Christ. And now Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, you and I have been made successors in this promise. Now you and I have this promise. So like God said to Isaac in the land, he said, I am with you. I will bless you. You and I have an anchor that we don't have to be afraid. Why? Like God told Isaac. Why? Because the promise I made to Abraham applies to you. Because this is the anchor we have. We no longer have to be afraid because God is with us. Amen. Second thing, our anchor in hope means we are, number two, not wavering in thought, but stable in faith. We are not wavering in our thoughts, but stable in our faith. You see, a boat is subject to the water, to the wind, to the current. A boat left without an anchor will eventually find land and shipwreck. The anchor is what keeps it from doing that. Our faith is much like that. Without an anchor for our faith, we are subject to the wind, to the current, to the waves of our lives, and our faith will drift and wander until it finally shipwrecks. But you see, God has given us an anchor in our hope so that our faith is firm and unwavering. James in the first chapter talks about if anybody lacks faith, they can ask God and receive it. And they said, believe that you receive it because God will give liberally and without reproach. Do not doubt. Somebody who doubts is a double-minded man. Why? Because they are unstable in all of their ways. You see, double-mindedness is simply this. Double-mindedness is when you think or have intentions for something and don't follow through. Like he said, if you need wisdom, ask God. Your intentions and your actions are to believe and to act upon the receival of what you have asked God for. If you doubt, now you're thinking and you're questioning yourself and now you're unstable. Have you ever been indecisive on a decision? Have you ever had something where it's, do I get this or do I get this or do I do this or do I do that? And it, it, and it, it consumes you. You lie awake at night thinking about the decision you have to make. And finally, after days of turmoil, you wake up and say, I'm going to make a decision today. And right as you're about to pull the trigger on that decision, you say, wait, no, 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 no. What about? And then you go right back into it. Double-minded man is tossed to and from like a wave in the sea. It's when we have thought and we have intention, but we take no action on that. Now, I brought you to James in the first chapter. I quoted it to you. Let's look at James in the second chapter. James in the second chapter, a familiar passage of Scripture talking about faith and works together. James in the second chapter, verse number 19, he says, You believe that there is one God. Hey, exhortation. Good job, church. You believe in one God. Good. Starting off on the right footsteps. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Exhortation gone. <laughs> Belief in God is good. That's, that's a good start. But even the demons believe and tremble. But look what it goes on to say. Verse number 20. But, 
Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That decision or idea or thought without action leaves you nothing in life? He goes on to say in verse number 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now let me jump ahead to, or jump back rather, to Hebrews the 11th chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead for you. Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse number 17 says, By faith! Remember, double-mindedness. Abraham had faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac. He who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Do you think that when God said, here's your only begotten son, here is the promise that I have given to you, here he is manifest, that when God said, I want him on the altar, that Abraham had the decision to be double-minded in his faith. But wait a minute, God. You said he was my promise. Why would you ask for him on an altar? That's not true. I'm going to hold on to him. I'm not going to do that. But the Bible tells us that the next morning, Abraham arose and took Isaac with him. He didn't waver. He didn't think he got up and it says in verse number 19, but why did he do that? Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. We talked about this. Abraham said, God, Isaac is my promise from you. And if you want Isaac on the altar, I'll put Isaac on the altar. And he might become ash. But I know that you are able to raise the ash up to become my son because your promise never fails. And you gave me your word and you gave me an oath. And you wouldn't be God if you didn't back it up. So Abraham was not wavering. He was not double-minded. He was solidified. You and I, in the trials of our life, in the things that we face, in the decisions that we have got to make, in the callings that God has brought us to, are not supposed to be double-minded, not thinking that we're going to receive. The Bible says, don't that, let that man not think he's going to receive anything. But rather, like Abraham, you and I have the anchor. The, the, the founded anchor of God that holds on to us, that tells us, listen, we have got to conclude that God is Able that God is able, whatever it is that we're facing, God is able. And that is the anchor which keeps us. I love the old statement, the old quote. I don't know who it came from. I tried to find it out, but couldn't find it. It seems like it's just one of those things that everybody seems to have said. But I love it. It says, God said it. That settles it. I believe it. Right off the bat, there is our anchor. When God says it, it's backed by the word of God. God's promises to Abraham to be blessed, to be a blessed nation. In blessing, he will bless them. In cursing, he will curse those who curse Abraham. God had covered Abraham. He had brought him a seed, a multiplication. When Abraham couldn't do it, Abraham knew that God was able. You and I, church, our anchor is to know that God is able. And in doing so, we stand on the firm ground of our faith. It is stable, not, not weary. Last one for today. Can you, can you handle one more for this morning? All right, all right. Our anchor in hope means we are, number three, not shaken by storms, but held in the word. We're not shaken by storms, but we are held in the word. You see, we don't hold the anchor. The anchor holds us. A boat might store an anchor in its journey, but when that boat drops the anchor, it's not the boat that holds the anchor. It's the anchor that holds the boat. And you see, this hope that God has given to us through his word and through his promise is the anchor that holds us in the trials of our lives. We will face tough times. We can't escape it. That's just the way life comes. But we can rest assured that because of the word and the promises of God and the faithfulness of God through the generations that we have seen written for us and kept for us in the Bible, that we have an anchor that will keep us in the storms of life. I like what Jesus tells us in Luke, the sixth chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead because I put it in the New Living Translation just because it's a little bit of an easier translation to grab a hold of. Luke in the 6th chapter, verse number 47, Jesus says, I will show you what it's like when somebody comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. You see, that's exactly what we just talked about when it came to being st uh, stable in our faith. Heard it, did it. Abraham had faith, he had thought, and he acted upon it. Faith with works. Jesus says, here's what faith and works does. Verse number 48. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. We just saw the devastation of what Hurricane Sandy could do, or Hurricane Sandy did to the eastern seaboard. Houses that were there on the ocean, 
were not even in, are not even in existence today. There's, there's not even evidence that they're there, buried in the sand, removed from where they were. But you see, you and I, our anchor is founded on the rock, Jesus Christ, the rock, the cornerstone in which we are built. Our foundation is there. Our anchor is set upon that rock. Our anchor is founded in the presence of God. That means nothing is going to loose that anchor. And guess what? When we have the realization that we don't hold the anchor, but the anchor holds us, we realize that nothing's pulling that anchor off its foundation. Therefore, nothing can pull us off our foundation. When the storms of life, when the floodwaters arise and it's going to beat against our lives, it's going to try to shipwreck us. Let me tell you something, we can rest assured. I love this. Why? Because in the storms of life, we know that God is with us. I love that God doesn't just give us illustrative examples. He gives us a physical example. Do you recall the story when the disciples were in the boat? There was a storm and they were afraid for their life. And there is Jesus Christ. In the back of the boat, asleep on a pillow. And the disciples come to Jesus and say, aren't, aren't you going to do something? We're going to die if we don't. You see, Jesus had something at that time that the disciples did it, And that was, Jesus was anchored in the Word of God. You see, Jesus was not, by the physical, actual, literal storms of life, Jesus knew that God had a purpose, God had a plan, God had a calling, and if that boat was to sink, that boat would still get through, that somehow, no matter how it was, they would make it to the other side because it was not God's will, it was not God's intention for them to sink right there. So Jesus had peace. You and I can have peace in the storms knowing that God has a plan, that our anchor holds us firm in the storms of life. The point was is that our, during the storms, we are held into the word of God, not the word of men. You see, all throughout generations, men have made promises and broken them. All throughout the, the existence of mankind, men have said things and walked away from them. They have said one thing and done another thing. We do not come or we do not base our hope or our anchor on the things of our life based on the teachings of man, but rather on the teachings of the Holy Spirit that have been preserved for you and I, the Word of God that has shown true for thousands and thousands of years. Jesus Christ said that heaven and earth will pass away, but His words by no means will ever pass away. You and I can rest assured sure that God, when he was faithful to his promise to Abraham, will be faithful to us today. And because of that, our storms, we will see it through. We can see through the storms today. What an encouragement we have. Our hope is that we find refuge in God through Christ. I love that old hymn, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Jesus is our rock in which our anchor is lashed to the words of God, that are the promises of God that are yes and amen through Him for us. Our confidence in Him serves to be an anchor, that confident expectation. So in conclusion, let me read this to you, 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, we have an anchor that holds on to us, not we to it. The anchor founded, that is sure, that we can rely upon. The anchor that is steadfast, that is sized for the challenges that we will face. The anchor that is rooted in the very presence of God, founded on the promises and the word of God, wrapped up in Jesus Christ, the rock, the cornerstone. Now we know that we have an anchor that is immovable. Therefore, when we hold on and we allow that anchor to take grip on our lives, we can be steadfast. We can be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, continuing through the storms. So when the sea is calm, we move forward towards our destination, the destination of heaven, taking with us the cargo of our lives and bringing as many people with us on the, on the journey as we can because our work in the Lord, our labor is not in vain because we have an anchor for our soul. Because of this anchor, we don't have to live a life of fear. Because of this anchor... We can have solid faith, not wavering or wandering. Because of this anchor, we will, we will survive the storms that come against us because of this anchor. The word and the promises of God. Hey, did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Last thing I want to do today. Before we do anything else, is I want to just give you the opportunity. I want to take just a few more moments of your time. Please don't get up. Please don't leave. Give me a moment of your attention. Let me ask you a very important question. 
If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question. It's so simple. You know, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you think, because you hope, because you want, you desire to get to heaven, that you're going to get to heaven. You can't get to heaven because you think so, because you hope so, because you want to, because God's going to look at you and say, well, they wanted it enough that they, they're going to get it. You can't get to heaven that way. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you went to church, because you sit in church, or because your parents told you as a child that you were a Christian? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you go to heaven because you go to church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you call yourself a Christian or because your parents told you you were a Christian that you're going to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, because you've never robbed your, uh, the 7-Eleven or cheated on your taxes, you give to charitable organizations? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven? Yet so often we think that because we're good, good people go to heaven. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I can ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's not about the outward appearance of what we do. God's after something more than that. And he tells us about that in the book of John in the third chapter as he speaks to Nicodemus, a religious leader of his day. And he tells Nicodemus, a man who had memorized the word of God, a man who gave to the poor, a man who taught the word of God in the synagogue, the church of his time. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. That's the only way you and I get there. And that is God's way. Jesus says, you must be born again. What is born again? Hollywood popular culture, society's made that out to be radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. In the eyes of God, in the heart of God, from the beginning of the word to the end of the word, here it is. God wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. There it is. So you can't get to heaven your way. can't get to heaven my way. The only way we can get there is God's way. Like we talked about today, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is and tremble. You can know and have a carnal knowledge or a mental ascent of who God is, but still miss out. Why? Because God is after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. He's after thought preceded by action. You say, Pastor, look, I appreciate that. You know, you get to heaven your way. I'll get to heaven my way. The only way, you know, we'll all get there the same. Listen, I, I love you enough. I respect you enough to tell you. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Can't get to heaven your way. Can't get to heaven my way. The only way we can get there is God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way to get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way today but God's way. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, speaking to the church, says to the church, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, Jesus says he will vomit you from his mouth. Wow, shocking, crude statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's define that in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down, occasional church attendance, token prayer here and again, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. Not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. Jesus Christ says if you're living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Can't get there that way. The only way you and I can get there is all of our hearts, all of our life. How do we do it? Let's do it no other way but God's way. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him, so let's do it God's way. Jesus says if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. If you deny him before men, he will deny you before his Father. So the decision is yours today. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible. And if that's you in this place, if I'm speaking to you, if the Lord of God, if the Word of God is speaking to you in your heart right now, here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you in just a moment. When I smack my hand on my Bible, we'll do it all together at the same time. I want you to raise your hand. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go to heaven. Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all my heart. I want to give him all my life. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. You say, well, if I raise my hand, I'm sure to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. You know what? You might be. But wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church? The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And you see, God has already done everything he could. We talked about it. God going the extra mile to secure your faith. And he did everything he could by giving for your sin. Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang on a cross naked, a spectacle for the world to see. The Bible says that Jesus Christ became our sin so that you and I could be reconnected with God. And all we have to do now is give Him all of our heart, give Him all of our life in return.
It's our decision, your free will choice. Who should give God all of their heart? Who should do this today? Who should raise their hand in just a moment if that's you? If you've never done it, if you've never given God all your heart, you've never given God all your life, you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, today is the day of your salvation. Pop your hand up in just a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll move forward from there. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you've never done this. Maybe you did it at a, at a, at a, a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusader. You did it as a child. You're not sure. Today, if that's you, raise your hand today. Let's get sure with Jesus Christ and, and leaving hell behind and ensuring your place in heaven and forever and ever and ever and ever. Finally, who should raise your hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? If you've been running from God instead of to God, today let's make this the day you go forward in your relationship with God, leaving the past behind and headed for heaven in the future. You know, you might even say, Pastor, look, I don't know if I believe in heaven. I don't know if I even believe in hell. I'm not sure where I stand. Let me tell you something. Let me love you enough again to respect you and tell you the truth. Just because you believe that it's not real doesn't mean it's not. Hey, you don't see the air, but yet it's there. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. Real enough for God to speak about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it. Real enough for the Bible to tell us about it. Therefore, it's real enough for you and I to stop playing games with God and take it serious. This is for you today. Today is the day of your salvation all over this place, wherever you're at, whether you're watching uh, in, the, in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, online, wherever you're at, from the front to the back of here, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, in just a moment, this is the moment of your salvation. And what I want you to do, when I count to three and smack my hand on my Bible, get ready, because this is your moment. When I do, pop your hand up, and I'll do it all together, and I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down, and we'll go forward today. Don't miss this opportunity. This is the, t the day of your salvation. This is the moment of your salvation. Stop playing games with God and let's go forward in our relationships with God today. All across this auditorium I'm going to get ready. I'm going to count. This is your moment. This is your time. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two. Keep them up for me. Three, four. I see you right there. Where are you guys at? I see four. four I saw a hand. Let me see that hand. Where were you at? Let me, six. Five, six. I got you. Let me see your hands. If you got your hands up today, I, I want to see them. Seven. I see you back there. All right, eight, I see the ushers pointing back there. Eight wise people, point people are pointing over here. Nine, ten, I got you right there. Eleven, I see you back there. Twelve, I see you. In the family rooms, is there anybody in the family rooms? I, I got that hand already, I think, right? I, did I get you guys already? All right, I got you guys. You can put your hands down. Twelve, thirteen, all right, right back there. Thirteen wise people, where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should listen. You know what, it's not about a man. Where I, I, I got the hand back there. I got you. 13 wise people. You know, it's not about me. It's not about the person next to you. It's the goodness of God that draws you. God's speaking to you right now. Don't start the first moments off with your new walk with God in disobedience. Come on, let's go forward for God today. If that's you in this place, go ahead and pop your hand up so I can see. We'll move forward in there. 13 wise people. Anybody else? Where are you at, number 14? Where are you at, number 15? Come on, where are you at today? You're saying, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You should. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? I don't want you to miss out, but I'm going to close this up right now. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for 13 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do for the 13 of you that raised your hand. And the 14, 15 of you that didn't raise your hands. It's not too late. In a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a song together. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, hey, I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life. You get saved by making him the Lord and Savior of your life. We want to help you with that. We want to pray. We want to change destinies with you together. So in a moment, we're all going to stand together. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody or somebody or you brought somebody, whatever it is, look to them and say, listen, I'll go or come with me and get out of your seat and get out of your chair and come meet me here at the altar and let's change destinies together. So as we all stand, please, nobody leave. But if you raise your hands, whether you're in the family room, in the back, the front, wherever you're at. Come on, let's change destinies together. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. If that's you, come on. Come on. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. Wherever you're at, you come. No turning back. The cross we
Hey guys, listen, today is a new day. Did you know that today is your new birthday? Today you're going to be born again, like Jesus said, all right? Today's the first day of the rest of your life, all right? Today's a, a day to smile. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a couple things. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel waving at you right over here. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to take you right over there. Listen, I promise I am as weird as it gets, and you got through me, okay? So he's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to, uh, we're going to uh, ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free literature, super easy reading, a little book that we have here at the church that we wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. You know, you get saved, now you say, what do I do now? We're going to help you with that. Real easy reading. You can do it in 30 minutes. Just give you some points and some tips on how to go forward in your relationship with God. The last and most important thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, make sure you get strong. A spiritual personal trainer, somebody that's going to meet with you right before church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, sit down with you, teach you some things for five weeks uh, to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from. And at the end of that, you're going to get a really neat Bible too, a really cool looking Bible. So that's all because we believe and want to invest in you and we know that you can do this and God is good and worth it. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again, I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.